Good evening and welcome. I'm Jean Udaly with the Dallas Architecture Forum, and we're delighted that you're joining us this evening as we present highly respected architect Toshiko Mori. We are grateful to all of our sponsors who've made this evening possible. We recognize our lecture season sponsors, Maharger Development, Reggie Graham, and Smink Art and Design. A big thank you to our series sponsors, Architectural Lighting Alliance, Bodron Fruit, Eggersman, HDR Architecture, HKS, Hawker, Jackson Walker, Kafka Properties, O'Brien Architects, and Perennials in Sutherland. Thank you to our lecture sponsors this evening, Boca Powell and WDG Architecture. And many thanks to our lecture supporter, Pritchard Associates. Thank you, Jean, and thanks to all of you for joining us tonight for this very special lecture. Toshiko Mori, FAIA, is the founding principal of Toshiko Mori Architect and a professor in the practice of architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Her studio is known for nearly four decades of innovative and influential work in a diverse body of projects that have received numerous design awards. TMA's intelligent approach to ecologically sensitive siting strategies, historical context, and innovative use of materials reflects a creative integration of design and technology. Their designs demonstrate a thoughtful sensitivity to detail and involve extensive research into the site conditions and surrounding context. Toshiko Mori Architect has worked on a broad range of programs, including urban, civic, institutional, cultural, residential, museum, and exhibition design. Some of her major projects include the Darwin D. Martin House Visitor Center, the Center for Maine Contemporary Art, master plans for the Brooklyn Public Library Central Branch and the Buffalo Botanical Gardens, Thread Cultural Center and Artist Residences, as well as Spas School and Teachers Residence, both in Senegal, and the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. Ms. Mori is in great demand for private residential commissions, and her retail projects include Issey Miyake showrooms, among many others. The studio's projects have been exhibited multiple times at the Venice Architectural Biennale, as well as at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Ms. Mori's projects have won awards from Architizer, the AIA, and the Royal Architecture Institute of Canada. She's been listed in Architectural Digest AD 100 many times and in El Decor's inaugural a-list titans. She's a member of the National Academy of Design, as well as the Academy of Arts and Letters and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Toshiko's recent awards and honors include the Louis Achenklaas Prize from the Museum of the City of New York, the ASCA Gold Medal, Architectural Records Women in Design Leader Award, and the AIA ACSA Topaz Medallion for Excellence in Architectural Education. Toshiko Mori Architect's work has been published in two new monographs, one with A Plus U Magazine and with Architangle entitled Toshiko Mori Architect Observations. The Dallas Architecture Forum is honored and very proud to have Toshiko Mori speak with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Toshiko. Good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me to your prestigious forum. Uh, you have a long history and legacy, and I'm very much honored tonight to be invited. And thank you so much for Jean and Joe for your very kind and generous introduction. And I'd like to start to share my screen. So tonight's uh, lecture is titled Observations. It's similar to that 
title of my monograph by Aki Tango, published in uh, Berlin uh, during the COVID. And uh, it's really about uh, my attitude about architecture and design. And uh, it really stems from observing the context, observing the program, and then in a way stepping up back a little bit uh, instead of imposing perhaps my styles, uh, but really to bring forth what something very unique to its own existence uh, on buildings in its own context is something I'd be interested in working through. So um, one of the first projects I show is in my neighborhood. My office is in Soho area of Manhattan. And as you know, New York, we are recovering very quickly from a tragedy of yesterday. And uh, we are all very nervous about being on the streets and subways, but New York, we have gone through so many crises that we are very quick to recover. And this is in the middle of um, Mott Street in Little Italy. And it's an insertion of a small building. It's only 20 feet wide and only about 60 feet long. But idea is this particular neighborhood in Manhattan has narrow streets. So you actually never see any buildings this way. We are always walking through in narrow streets in oblique. This idea for this building is to see come up with this facade, which you can observe obliquely going up and down, so that the facade might actually give a very interesting idea of a change and mutability. And it's a quiet building, but at the same time, it's noticeable because it will look different from different angles. And also the material can be very black. It's fair trade uh, granite. But also in the bright days, it can be light gray. And when it rains, it also has a very different kind of expression. So this idea is uh, to come up with a very different type of facade in Little Italy, which is a historical neighborhood. And it actually complies with its regulation in terms of proportion of stone facade versus glass. So when you really figure out uh, the facade proportion of Little Italy, but when you arrange windows vertically together, this particular facade is exactly the same proportion as neighboring buildings. So in a very subtle way, it looks very different looking, but in a way proportionally, it's actually the same. And this twist is taking place within a regulation setback about 10 and a half inches. So it just twists from one to the other, which actually gives the visual interest when you're looking back uh, like this. So in a way, this is a way to stroll the streets and some people notice and some people may pass by and look back and then second look. So it's a very subtle idea of expressing the idea of urbanity of this particular neighborhood. And this is what it looks like from the back. And in the back, which faces west, uh, has a twisted metal louvers, so which it actually helps to uh, control the glaring western light. Next project I show is uh, in Brown University in uh, Providence. Brown University master plan has a very unique and very uh, sustainable attitude, which is densification of its own campus. Instead of spreading wide, uh, they would always want to densify its own campus and also to uh, promote preservation of existing buildings. And as much as possible to use existing building types and renovate them and make them into a campus program. So there's an integration of residential neighborhood and this particular campus, which is kind of, as you can see, is woven into it. And my project is uh, Watson Institute of, of uh, Public and International Affairs. And Watson Institute, as you can see from my name, was established by Tom Watson of IBM, who is a graduate of Brown University. And he envisioned uh, this particular center to be a place where we can have an open and safe dialogue and especially as many of you might uh, recall that he was an ambassador to Russia 
during the Cold War. And he actually thought that global dialogue is necessary, but in a way that places that many different disciplines of university from economics to politics to social studies can come together, even opposing views that can come together. So existing on the left side is uh, Rafael Vignale's building, which has mostly offices and one meeting space. And I was told to come up with a building and also renovate the building on the bottom to make it a new center. Uh, it's called Stephen Roberts Hall. Um, and that becomes a place of classrooms and place of exchange. And the arrow is actually Brook Street is mostly residential streets. And uh, in a way that we are supposed to respect this particular scale, but at the same time have a relationship for Brook Street to stay as streets, the students can come across east and west and also promote a passageway through the center of it to make a small new uh, campus out of this, um, including a new building to the north of us and how to make this into a new campus for the charge. The view of Brook Street with existing building really responds to more residential character by using exact same wood. And then this particular wood cladding color is the same and it really works with a more, much more residential scale. As it wraps around, uh, it be, uh, transforms into a glass facade. And this is actually a bridge which connects new building with this existing building. So bridge actually reaches over arm um, as if it's wrapping around an old building and telling uh, more of a historical building. This is part of this new center. And this building used to be a rooming house and we had to renovate into a classroom. And as you can go around, there's a walkway which leads you into a new building and new uh, campus uh, central space, open space. And inside uh, what I call is Agora, and really coming from inspiration of a Greek idea of democracy in which the spatial relationship between democracy is that it, it always had to exist within the reach of human voice. And of course, you can see the Greeks has expanded that idea into Greek theaters and um, oratory experience, but as we can see, we have other devices, technological devices to extend the voice. But for this particular space, I want to make sure that there's informal exchange and we work with Arab acoustics so that one can actually listen to the speakers, but informally around the staircase that surrounds it, uh, students, observers can just hang out there, but in asking formal questions can engage in dialogue. And uh, this particular institute is also interesting because uh, during the previous uh, election cycle, they have invited both parties to get into a very civilized dialogue, which is absolutely necessary. And I think it's a mission and idea of Tom Watson to really try to mend what he perceived as a divided world. And uh, as you can imagine, this type of spaces is really is essentially necessary as we can see of global affairs which is taking place which is and also national politics in which our divisions are very severe uh, and and also the spaces here is used as social spaces uh, it's full of light very popular with students and then uh, they have uh, informal seminars taking place and uh, this will be what it will look like as you can see there's acoustic materials in which it both reflects the sound but absorbs the noise and there's no echoing eff eff effect so this is something uh, about my observation of how to gather people how to have this open safe dialogue within an academic set setup Next project is in Buffalo, New York, and uh, it's uh, a Buffalo Botanical Gardens. And uh, it has a greenhouse, which was built in 1899 by Lord and Burnham. And Lord and Burnham is a prefabricated greenhouse company, which has started in 
buffalo. Also, it's part of a South Park where Olmsted did the major master plan. And our charge was to expand uh, on this park. This is actually, you can see on the left side, it's in that particular corner. But over the ages, green, uh, this bot botanical garden has been kind of cut off from the um, garden itself. So the idea for us to, is to embrace its existence within this context, but also to be able to expand it uh, beyond it's a program for display because uh, as opposed to Dallas, which you have a lot of nice sun and very nice weather and warm weather, Buffalo has snow and cold and ice. And kids love to come and look at and study tropical plants and experience tropical environment, especially during the middle of winter, but they really don't have classroom space and so forth. So this is the original building uh, built and this is the current condition. And idea for us is to, as a concept, to come up with addition, which is in the back of historical greenhouse so that it does not interfere. It's lower than uh, existing buildings. So when you really have a frontal look, you really don't see what's happening, but at the same time, it gives a flexible program to expand into educational programs. And also large new courtyard uh, is going to be a place for weddings, which actually is a very popular venue. And as you can imagine, uh, in the middle of a winter, of course, but also during the summer and spring, but it's just been, they don't have enough space. And as you can imagine that for nonprofits, a very attractive revenue resource. So we have done the planning, which uh, again, in the back of a greenhouse opens up to the South Park with diverse type of plant courtyards. And then also a new uh, circulation in which it will start to use much more actively all the roots around it. An idea of this particular new structure, we call it uh, a split gables. We just took the typical greenhouse, industrial greenhouse, and then with this structure split open to make it into more parametric in, uh, uh, geometry. But at the same time, uh, it has a simple structure. So in a sense, it's really, it's easier to construct. And instead of glass, we proposed a membrane of ETFE, which is much lighter and much more ecological and safer. Uh, if there's any problem, uh, it can be repaired. And if it burns, it just uh, becomes a dust. And, and also it's double layer. So one can control the heat much better by inflating or deflating. So, uh, so and also one can print different type of patterns and to uh, control shading condition for different plants, which is uh, very, very useful. And it's already been used for greenhouses and zoos in this country, as well as uh, vastly used in England in order to replace glass. So these are some of the ideas of what it looked like and structure columns, which has structure and infrastructure, we call them flower columns. And these are some of the interior view of it. And that's actually the overall view in which beyond it, this South Park is embraced as a part of a new context for this historical house, as you can see in uh, these renderings. <clears throat> I like to also talk about uh, another project, long-term project for us back in New York, in Brooklyn. And it's a Brooklyn Public Library's uh, central branch, as you can see in the red dots, that's where it is. It faces Grand Army Plaza and uh, it's in uh, Eastern Parkway where it's very, very active. And as you can see, it's uh, surrounded by residential neighborhood and part of it actually connects back to botanical gardens. And then in it, we have uh, proposed uh, moving parts of our programs and especially to unite administration and to maximize uh, use for public 
and uh, many of our books have been relocated in the library systems so that we were able to gain a lot of space within it. And this library is very, very popular. It's really crowded and from kids to older people to I have actually seen very well-known writers um, using it and then to uh, business entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, it's, it's really actively used. And uh, it's very interesting because public libraries, they offer knowledge for free. And then this is one of a few places where mothers feel safe in coming with kids and let the kids roam around to go look for their own books where the mothers can go and look to go and they can actually meet together. It's a very rare public institution that's community oriented. And also because of it, a lot of kids in the neighborhood do come there to do homeworks afterwards and we have information commons and, and also part of this neighborhood is a digital desert and lack of uh, internet access. You'll be surprised in the middle of New York, but this community has a large amount of uh, new images. And so this library also offers a uh, language program and job. Uh, so in a way to reprogramming it, working through this was a very, very big effort. And this was uh, original 1941 library a lobby, which was recently renovated. And uh, this is also, uh, how do you say, a new and noteworthy different ways of working with librarians. And I found librarians to be an amazing asset and I call them knowledge navigators. They really have knowledge, which is very different than going through internet for browsing and the browsing in library is much more dynamic. So for this one, we asked each librarians to curate a selection of books from their collection and also assembling with the new books so that there's a changeable like exhibit, but then people can come and read the books and browse the books and it's a very dynamic way to display uh, different talents of librarians as we go through. Also, we have a business library and uh, Brooklyn is very well known for uh, small startups, entrepreneurs, and it provides a places for gathering. We have meeting places, they can use it, and also seminars uh, from resume creation to um, how to do finances and all sorts of seminars and then becomes a very vibrant places for neighborhoods uh, economy, new economy and new generations. And uh, this has also been very, very popular. As I zoom into it, as you can see front of library, as I mentioned, does face Grand Army Plaza. It's always very monumental, but the community is by and large in the back of it. So this idea was to create a back door to be a new door for the community use. So from on the very back wing, um, made a new end entry for what I call uh, civic commons in which they have passport services, ID services, and this space is used for meeting with community uh, groups. And during the COVID, this uh, civic commons is used as uh, grab and go, meaning like people will order books and they will come pick up books and then return it when they couldn't really access an entire library system. So this was actually, again, observing the community to see dynamic of it, to creating a new type of program for library function. Now to uh, Rockland, Maine. This is actually, Rockland is a very small community. It's about um, a popula small population uh, and it's better known as what you call a uh, lobster capital of the United States. And so this was a proposal for center for main contemporary arts. So contemporary arts and lobster capital may not actually merge together, but at the same time, uh, Maine has a history of artists from Andrew Wyess to Winslow Homer, more recently Alex Katz, Louis Dodds, and uh, all these artists has been really 
had active uh, residency there. So there was a really big chance for this uh, Center for Maine Contemporary Arts to survive in this location. And uh, idea for this is to create a courtyard, which is public. And then around the courtyard, we'll make a glass enclosed uh, area where uh, people in town can look into it. So it's an uh, institution which is open so that it's not like elitist closed stuff that arts not very uh, connected to their daily lives, but in a way they pass by it, they see people working in there and they actually do see a glimpse of art and kids and locals are free. And um, in the middle, uh, this is a large, uh, to a large uh, exhibition space and uh, taking advantage of northern light here. And one of the reasons that people are attracted to this area is because of, again, the reflection of light from a sea. The quality of light is quite clear and then very beautiful. So that's actually a big attraction to many of our artists. So this gallery, you can actually get to enjoy the source of inspiration for uh, many of the artists. So this is actually, uh, in, you can see the administration in action from a courtyard and that's actually uh, the courtyard as you can see it. Um, back to New York, I will show this project because it has a relationship to the last two projects in Senegal because I worked with Michael Stein who is Schleisbergman partners, a structural engineers to come up with this canopy for number five line. And then uh, it's uh, in the middle of Hudson Yards. It's probably the tiniest project, but this is the only public access to a large uh, development of Hudson Yards. So this idea was also to create a canopy which is multi-directional. So it's in a park. And if you've been to New York, subway canopy in New York City is single directional. But this site is very close to Hudson River. It's incredibly windy. And if you actually come up with a standard uh, canopy, more linear one, you create a wind tunnel in the worst way. So that this particular one is somewhat like a total back, is protective to the people arriving and also people coming in from a wind. So that wind kind of goes over it and it creates a, a serene, quiet uh, pose before they get to the business of Hudson Yards or coming from very lively atmosphere of Hudson Yards back into, uh, back home. So this is actually the elements. There are two of those canopies and uh, some of uh, details that we came up with. Strais Bergman, this is curvilinear uh, looking, but it's all made out of a grid shell, which means everybody, everything is uh, rectilinear shapes. And we had to work very closely with the Metropolitan Subway Authority to make sure if we have enough parts and then cleanability is also very much of uh, important elements for uh, public transportation uh, idea that we were working with. So this is actually the canopy. And it's, uh, I show it because it really relates to the idea of a new uh, structures that we came up with the next couple of projects. And this is now very far away to Senegal in West, West Africa. And Dakar is the capital. The area where we are working is near Tambacunda. It's about seven hour car ride. It's a very remote place and uh, also underserved in terms of economy. And also it's so, uh, have, uh, in, in a way, it doesn't have a material wealth. And I was invited to work on this project by Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation. They were Bauhaus refugees from Nazi Germany, arrived in first Black Mountain School, 
uh, and then uh, North Carolina, and then uh, Joseph Albers became a very well-known professor at Yale University's art school. And many of you might know of uh, his paintings uh, and color theories. And his wife, Annie Albers, uh, is very well known as an uh, amazing weaver. And so their foundation uh, had, had a mission to help uh, others who might be in need. And Joseph and Annie established their foundation in the 70s, and they have identified some different parts of the world. And this particular area did not have any uh, Western medicine. It's, suffer from highest rate of maternal and infant mortality. And so, uh, because Albert's foundation has an uh, outpost in Paris, it started with doctors in Paris individually to send doctors to really uh, introduce uh, medicine for public health. And that started nearly 25 years ago. So they are very familiar with this area. And one community here in Xinjiang, and uh, in this case where it's outlined here, where I uh, proposed a cultural center called Thread is within the medical compound, which was founded and built by Albert's foundation nearly two decades ago. And uh, this is within a village of about seven to 800 people. And, uh, the community is very vibrant, very creative. It's the area where about 12 different tribes live together and uh, share many arts, performing arts and music together, but they are actually do not speak the same language. So the clinic has been very, very active in like promoting skits or something so that through the skits, they understand how to protect themselves uh, against uh, epidemic like malaria and also Ebola. It, it's very creative way of integrating uh, public health and arts in this. And that's actually the landscape. And Dr. Magay Ba in uh, white, he is uh, one person who's really an amazing person who operates this particular clinic. And, uh, and also he, in this area is one of a, uh, highest uh, rate of migration, again, because of lack of jobs. And he actually thought by stabilizing uh, to introduce culture, it actually can give some jobs to people in the community to become more self-sustaining. So this is actually existing clinic. And Senegal is 90% uh, a Muslim, which means there's uh, polygamy and polygamy exists because of need for survival. Uh, as I mentioned before, before, because of high maternity rate and then high infant uh, mortality rate, it was necessar necessary. But then by establishing this clinic and stabilizing public health, there has been uh, less need for this. And again, makes it much more secure in terms of uh, food and resources. But at the same time, uh, in this particular community, what I propose is a compound on the left. And as you can see, there are cisterns associated with it. Um, one thing I observed there is that because of climate change, aquifer is, is disappearing. And then women and especially girls, they had to go far to procure water. If someone digs a well, the next village is a uh, well uh, dries out. And as opposed to places like Bermuda or Ethiopia, where they really had uh, cisterns uh, keeping rainwater, they didn't have that need. So they didn't have that tradition. And we looked at the water use. This was really great analysis by Dr. Mageba to figure out what will be the need. And we said that perhaps this cultural center can try to address about 30% of villagers need by the roof of this particular center being able to procure rainwater during rain season. And 
we figured out that if they had a means to uh, keep rainwater, they can totally survive the dry, uh, dry season. And also having this water nearby, um, girls don't have to go to uh, collect water. Uh, they, in a sense, it's actually became a big social problem because they are missing schools. And also they have to face danger of uh, animals or bandits in the area. So that's actually has different roles out of it. And for this particular project, we, as I said, it's very remote and uh, very low resource. And we used local materials as thatch roof from grass just growing there and local bamboo and mud bricks. And, and as you can imagine, there's no air conditioning. So we had to use uh, methods of ventilation to create stack effect to promote a cool air to come in and also the roof to help collect water. It has two courtyards. In Muslim communities, many times for formal occasions, men and women uh, gather separately, but this has been operation for nearly uh, six years. And it's, that has not been the case uh, because Senegal is a progressive uh, Muslim community. They mingle, but instead different generations uh, gathering in different places. So that's actually what it will look like. And that's the inspiration for me is what you call African hut. And, but when you really look at it, it's very sophisticated. So this is when me and uh, Michael Stein of Schreich Bergman really looked at it and we said, one, because of necessity is that we had to work with local materials. And also we are working with local builders who know how to build and to also give them jobs to see how we can actually make this particular materiality and technique into a larger public building. Um, this is a substrate of structure. So we came up with analysis of structure and uh, came up, up with a shape, which this particular wavy shape uh, makes it very stable and enables this particular structure to expand into larger structure, but using the same exact same technique that they're used to. And these are some of the uh, uh, structural sketches that uh, Michael Stein has come up with. And then uh, it is a local technique uh, and vernacular technique, but we were able to double the bamboos in areas where it's very high stress. Uh, and also we sandwich them and we have to sandwich on the other ways to kind of figure this out. Uh, also there's, uh, as I mentioned before, they speak different languages, but we made this choreographic drawings to show them how to build it instead of working drawings. Um, and in this area, it, what's amazing is they also use music and there's always drummers. It's drumming with rhythms to work it through. So in a way, these particular diagrams is how they followed one after the other to build this particular center. Um, and then also we use a small amount of steel, which is more of a angles and wrap them up in straw to strengthen some areas. And uh, this is a local thatch uh, people like master thatch roofers uh, making a thatch roof out of it. And a lot of kids came to help <laughs> uh, uh, in working through this particular ideas. And then looking at any arbors uh, we, uh, weaving, we actually made the roof slightly thicker and it adds insulation and a thatch is dense, but it's porous. So it really promotes air to escape, but thick enough so that rain doesn't come in. It's kind of very interesting idea, um, ecological ideas of working through this. So these are some of the uh, materials that I have talked about, map bricks. And they also looked at, and we looked at example of uh, Joseph Albers work in uh, Yale and also uh, Harvard Law School, he used the bricks as a patterns. And, and also 
we looked at much more of a local tradition of uh, this type of uh, brickwork and brick and block work. This one is very intelligent because uh, during the snowstorm, it does not let the snow, uh, no, sand in. Snow. Did I say snowstorm? I'm in New York. This is, like, this is sandstone. I'm sorry, it's sub-Saharan sub Africa. But because of slope, it lets the sand slide off, but let the air in. So in a way, it's a very, very smart way. And we have incorporated these kind of ideas and techniques to, to it, which they know how to build it. So that's the way it is. And also it's angled so that there's enough ventilation, but then enough privacy in uh, some of the rooms. They also looked at uh, some of early Joseph Albers uh, work, and this is from Bauhaus. And Joseph Albers uh, was a very poor student, and this was really notable called glass paintings. He used the uh, discarded material in Bauhaus to make this beautiful work. And then that kind of inspired people and looking at some other work. And uh, in Dakar, they have uh, discarded uh, broken tiles. And this idea of broken tiles and broken materials, there is a tradition in Senegal and they actually do eat broken rice because they sell the rice for income. All the broken rice left at the bottom of the sack, they use for their own meal, but they actually say that it's, it's more tastier and I can kind of, uh, I understand it. And then because of it, there is certain crafts, local crafts of using broken tiles to make mosaics. So people uh, made their own uh, tile work in this uh, floor, which I think they are very, very beautiful. And um, that actually became the flooring and kids come there after school. And uh, this was opening in which I, I, we, we had like a 2000 people came. So that could be used at the scale of kids or it can actually accommodate very large crowd. And then uh, some days uh, there are very few people. Artists, there are two artists, res it's really artist residents and uh, artists come from all over the world and also from Africa and local. And not always, there's one local artist uh, did amazing residency on music and he became a very big star in Senegal. And we have filmmakers and uh, textile designers coming through. One aspect which I did not ex expect to develop, as I said uh, before, by collecting water, how they would use it. And women in, made an agricultural collective with the water, they started to make vegetable gardens. And then uh, their uh, high value vegetables like okra or eggplant, and it really sells in high value. And uh, this area, it, used, it has been that equivalent of 10 US dollars can send one kid to school for a year. So economy is very, very different. But because of this, it really stabilized the uh, life of a community and then they were able to produce honey from moringa and also fonio which is gluten-free grain that they grow in this particular center so unexpectedly uh, in a way the water that was procured from a roof is has become a very big source of uh, new economy uh, I think last project I was uh, present is uh, in my study of this particular rule structure, we realized that there's so much more possibility to work through. And then also we were requested by another community, which is much more further west in one of drier places and much more conservative Muslim community to help them build a, a school. And this is area where there was no no public school and only schools that existed was uh, really religious schools and and really literacy rate was very low and and I think as you can imagine the poverty and ignorance are the lethal combination that can damage kids future 
And I have to say, Nicholas Fox Weaver, who's a head of Albers Foundation, had negotiated for a long time, about three years, with the uh, head of the community to come up with a school that combines religious education with secular education, knowing that they have to learn how to add the math, the languages, and then practical skills, carpentry, cooking. And it's for the kids uh, six years old to 10 years old. We can have up, up to 300 kids and those two buildings, one is teacher's residence, the other one still without the roof. Now we have a roof, is a bathroom for the kids. And it, this is actually the site and it has three enclosed classrooms, one indoor outdoor classrooms with outdoor space. And um, a slightly different structural strategy in which we have series of walls and so that each classroom has a very different spatial makeup. And uh, this is the diagram of it. And, and this area, it's dry, but aquifer is still intact. So we were able to just use the water to go straight down into aquifer to try to trap the water. And again, they have started agricultural collective fairly successfully. This is uh, in um, opening day. And, and like in thread, in this case, we also um, made the roof uh, fairly thick and fairly high and from uh, air coming in. As I said, this is much more drier and hotter that outside temperature can go from 105 to 115, but inside it stayed like under 90, it's like 85. So, uh, Standard classroom for kids given by government is made out of concrete blocks and then a, a metal roof. So you can imagine the kids get very hot in there and they don't want to be in there. So they study outside, but eventually they don't want to go to school. But this school, they actually feel it's nice and cool and also a very uh, against the harsh daylight, it just gives them optimum amount of light within the classroom. Also gives a uh, area of a plate, partially shade, which is, uh, and then partially sun. So they have inside outside elements. So it became very popular with kids. And this particular shape also recalls some of the ancient dwellings in this area. So historically, people had some familiarity with this shape, but not this size. And then because of it, uh, they call it Le Co Maison, schoolhouse, which was uh, coincidentally Joseph Albers did um, teach in schoolhouses as in the United States, you have those one school, one room schoolhouses, and this is like that. And so this idea is you, they become family and they study together and, um, and also we insisted that boys and girls uh, study together and, and then they are like a playing together. So this is actually the last couple of last images I show. And I think last thing I want to say is as an architect, as observing the context and when you really look at who we are serving and I really think that yes, there are clients who pay for this they are government and they are big library institutions, but really ultimately, I think our ultimate clients are those kids who make the future for our world. So I just like to end my lecture with this particular observation that uh, these are the people we have to serve. Thank you so much. Thank you, Toshiko. Your presentation was amazing. Um, how you have been able to really put, I think, almost poetic um, design into your projects is, is wonderful. And I know that everyone out there is very appreciative. We have time if anyone would like to submit a quick question to the Q&A box. We'll have time for maybe a couple of questions. Uh, but again, Toshiko, we are very thankful to have you speak for us. And I think the projects in Senegal uh, just are, show the your consciousness of how it's important to use architecture and design to improve lives and, and to change lives for the better. So that's important for all of us. So again, if you have any questions, you can quickly send them via the Q&A box. I think probably everyone is just kind of um, just, uh, just meditating on what you've said. It's, it's been wonderful.
Um, so I think with that, we will go ahead and just and close. Uh, thank all of you for attending. Thank our sponsors. And again, Toshiko, we're grateful for you and for your work.